Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. This is Bree Noble. I'm excited to be here today with Jared Judge from Book Live. And I'm excited because I love talking gigs. And we're going to talk about some things that are going to help you expand your repertoire when it comes to gigs. Because I know that a lot of times we feel like we're boxed in a little bit with gigs. And I'm a big fan of finding those alternative venues venues where you don't have to bring the audience, you know, all that stuff that is frustrating as a musician when you feel like you're having to do all the heavy lifting for your gigs. So I'm excited to be getting into this conversation with Jared. Before we start talking about all that juicy stuff, Jared, I'd love for you to give them a little background on you um, as a musician and how you got into talking specifically about booking gigs. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Bree. I appreciate it. Um, I've been a musician all my life, ever since I was eight years old, and I picked up a violin. I loved it so much that I decided to go to school for it, um, much to the dismay of my band director, who was trying to discourage me from going to school for music, saying it would be very hard to actually make a living doing what you love. But, That's sad uh, <laughs> that your band dr- director said that. That just bums me out. <laughs> I know. I think he, I think he was trying to weed out those who weren't serious about it. Yeah. Um, but I pursued and got two degrees in music. I got a bachelor's in music education. I taught public school for a couple years. I was teaching little kids all the way up to high schoolers. And then I decided to go back and get my master's degree in orchestra conducting because at that point, I had my heart set on being a professional orchestra conductor, either for an opera or a symphony orchestra. And so, you know, I was doing what most musicians who want to pursue that kind of heavy goal do is they dive all in, you take all your lessons, you learn your music theory, your history, and um, you take whatever advanced courses you want to or have to, like you know, I didn't want to be a librarian, but I was taking music library sciences. That's awesome. I did all that too, but I, I like had to take conducting and I certainly did not want to be a conductor. <laughs> For sure. Uh, I was one of the crazy ones who did. <laughs> so as I'm getting close to graduating with my master's in orchestra conducting, I was flying across country, taking these auditions, spending thousands of dollars on plane tickets and hotel rooms, literally sacrificing everything just to try to win that one spot. But every single audition, I would like get to the final round and then I would be cut. And it was so frustrating that each one, I kind of felt like my dream was just slipping out of my hands. And it kind of came to a head when I took an audition for the Air Force Band to be a conductor for the Air Force. And that was one where, like, when I took the audition and, you know, as, a, as someone who studied conducting, you, you know what it feels like to stand in front of these musicians who you've got a hundred of them. They're, like, watching you and they're judging your musical abilities, or at least you feel that way. Uh, kind of feels like being on American Idol, except with a <laughs> hundred Simon Cowles. <laughs> but I got through it, and I thought we made some great music. And then the commander of the band asked me, "Hey, come, please come to my office and shut the door behind you." And I was getting really excited, but also like nervous. And he says, "Jared, that was a really good audition. You clearly have a lot of talent, and you, the exams that we had you take before, you did really well on, but." we can't offer you the job at this time. Mm-hmm. Come back come back again in a year and try again. And I couldn't come back in a year because I was graduating from ma- my master's program and had to get a job to like pay the bills. And so it was super frustrating. I'm curious, and, do you feel like it had anything to do with you being young? I'm not so sure. 
because uh, I think the person who did get the spot was actually a little younger than me. Oh, okay. I'm just asking because I used to work at the opera and I feel like there was some of that stigma of like, we can't bring on someone that's super young because mm. they're not seasoned. But like, how do you get seasoned, you know? Yeah, possibly. I'm sure that was the case for some of my other auditions, but um, not this Air Force one because I got to see who got the job and uh, they were younger than me. Oh, man. Um, I'll get to the gigging part soon, though, because like, <laughs> this is just kind of important to understand the backstory because I was just losing hope of that dream. And when I finally like flew back to Milwaukee where I was in grad school, I reported back to my teachers like, hey, another failure, guys. Help me out here. What do I do? And I, I told them, like, I'm graduating in a couple months. I'm seeing all of my classmates graduate with no music jobs. How do I make money as a musician so that I don't have to work a corporate job or, you know, work in food service? And the crazy part was, like, they told me they had no advice for me. Yeah. They, they said, keep doing what you're doing. Maybe you'll get lucky. Or you can teach to, like, support your income until you finally get that job. It's like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll teach, but that's not really why I started being a musician in the first place. And so I was, like, not happy with their advice. <laughs> and uh, they did give me one piece of advice that actually was the most important advice. Was They said, we can't help you here, but our college has a business school. You can go ask their advice. Oh, thanks. Now, <laughs> right? This is why I was a double major in music and business, because I started to see the writing on the wall in that situation. <laughs> well, that was very smart of you, Brie. <laughs> <laughs> so I did take their advice, and I walked across campus to the business school, and I said, hey, I'm this nerdy little musician. I don't want to be a business major. I just want to figure out how to have a career in music, and the music school is not helping. Can you help? Thankfully, they were very kind to me. They said, yes, we got your back. And basically, they gave me essentially free private lessons in how to start a business. Wow. Yeah, they had this student startup challenge where they let all of their mostly undergrads, but a couple grad students, too. They helped them start a business. And they told me, you need to start treating your music career like a business. Mm. And I was like, like, it, hmm. like an incubator kind of program. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. I love that. It was awesome. And I don't know if you know, much, well, you said you were a business major. The business school, they love post-it notes. Like every wall was covered with post-it notes of just ideas and things. Mm -hmm. And it, it felt like such a creative space, which I was really surprised by because I had always thought business schools, you know, you got to wear your, your suits and ties and nobody is creative. It's just all about numbers and making money. But the creative energy coming from this place was incredible and they were helping me build a career out of music yeah honestly i think that the entrepreneurial side has really gotten into schools finally like i went to school in the mid 90s so it was just starting like we i did take an entrepreneurship class and i still feel like it was very like book oriented it wasn't like what you're talking about but i felt like they were trying and i think now they've finally gotten to the point where it's like oh we need to teach these people to be entrepreneurs yeah for sure unfortunately it wasn't in the music building though it was right. just in the business building that's the next step <laughs> for sure so when i went through that incubator program they taught me how to treat my music career as a business and specifically in my case because i am a violinist they taught me how to launch a wedding string quartet mm. and we identified there are markets of people, and it's not just weddings that is a market. There are markets of people that will pay a high price to have live music at their event. And they said, let's focus on weddings because, you know, violin is a good match for that right now. Mm -hmm. And then I bet nonprofits are a good match for that, too. We absolutely. had so many fancy events at the opera where we had, you know, things like that. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, corporate events, too. Mm hmm. So they said, let's start with one. And when you master one, you can add on more. And I was like, okay, I trust you. Which I love. I love that. I love that. And we're like, you could do these 20 things. Go do them. No. Yeah, focus on one. <laughs> <laughs> and so they literally just taught me the very basics about marketing myself, 
like how to get the word out in front of the people who have access to my ideal customer, which at the time was brides and grooms. Still is, actually. I still play lots of weddings. Um, so they taught me the marketing part. And they said, like, once you have all these people who are interested in you, you can't just respond to emails like you're better than them or just give them one word answers. You actually have to take them through what they called a sales process. And I was like, I don't know what this is. I'm a musician. And they don't <laughs> teach that in music theory class. Um, so they were like, okay, here is a script that people have used to sell wedding services in the past. Read it, study it, adapt it to what you do. And then we'll practice a couple times and you'll sell me on live music. It's like, this is weird, but I trust you. Let's do it. And so I did it and I practiced on the business teachers. And that gave me the confidence that when I actually had my first bride and groom come to me saying, hey, we need a string quartet for our wedding down in Illinois. What do you do? I literally like just got my script out because I was so uncomfortable doing this. I had to start reading the script. I couldn't wing it, you know? Yep. And I just kind of read it to them. And they like, I could tell that their their eyes lit up and they were like really excited that I could provide exactly what they wanted at their wedding. Mm. And they asked, well, how do we book you? And that's when I like fumbled because at the time I didn't have a contract. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, uh, you can Venmo this account. Say, did you even have a way for them to pay? <laughs> I used my personal Venmo. Awesome. Got to start um, somewhere. Totally. So I, I went back after after talking to that couple. I went back to the business people and I said, hey, I just booked my gig. They just put some money in my Venmo. And they were like, that's great. But here, you got to use a contract. Mm. <laughs> so that's when I learned like, contracts um, especially because like years prior I sort of played a professional gig which was a wedding for a friend of a friend without a contract and I had gotten stiffed mm. and they're like you're gonna get stiffed again if you don't yep so uh, just fast forward a little bit like after they taught me those business skills the last step that they said is like once you have this process down all you have to do is repeat this process until you have enough high paying gigs to meet your income goals so that you don't have to get a job to meet that income goal elsewhere. And I did. And within a year of me starting that live music business, which still exists, I'm still playing about 150 weddings, even sort wow. of in the middle of COVID. Um, you know, that is when we booked our first six figures in bookings within a year, which was crazy because like I didn't think that I could book that on my own I always thought I would just have to s settle for gigs that paid 50 bucks here and there I didn't think it could actually provide me an income unless I won an audition that's incredible and can I ask like six figures that's amazing but of course you've got people on payroll like there's other people in the quartet it's not mm -hmm. just you but you're doing all the admin stuff so did you feel like at that point you were making the income for yourself that you wanted yet? Um, when I first hit the six figures, no, because, you know, obviously a quartet is four people. So if you divide 100,000, that's 25K per person. Um, but so assuming that, you were taking some for be doing all the admin work, unless your other people were also doing the selling. So I started out not taking any, which was a mistake. The business <laughs> school told me, you got to start taking some money because you're doing all this work that your other musicians are not. Right. Uh, so that's when I started putting in a profit margin and mm -hmm. then paying myself some more for doing that work. Um, so yeah, that's when we I realized like I had to actually book even more than just six figures a year to make my own personal goals work. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh my gosh. So how long ago was that? That, you that, hit that? So I started out on this path in 2016 Okay. So I guess that was about five years ago now. Okay. So fast forward, where are you today? You said you're still doing that side, but it sounds like you've also added some other things. Yeah, definitely. So um, I mentioned that, you know, all of my classmates were graduating and not getting a music job. And that was kind of painful to watch because we were all pursuing the same goals. And 
if anyone's been in music school, you know there's this com camaraderie with your classmates and you don't want anything bad to happen to them. So when they were graduating without these music jobs, they started asking me like, hey, how do we start booking these private events for ourselves and make some money so we don't have to work corporate jobs? And so I started teaching them and I was, you know, doing it for free to start just to make sure like it worked mm -hmm. for them, not just myself. And it did, which was awesome to see. Um, so now I've been taking on some students and I've put together some courses to teach other musicians on how to treat their live music careers as live music businesses. So that's another way that I uh, help out musicians and I do make money off of that too, but that's not the reason why I'm doing it. But then another crazy thing was that doing all of this takes a lot of work and a lot of that work is not playing music, right? Because mm -hmm. really, as musicians, we want to play as much music as possible and delight as many audience members as possible. Nowhere in that is like, I want to do as much administrative work as possible. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Surprise. So, uh, but this was actually becoming a problem for me um, starting in grad school, but even like right afterwards, because when you're a student, that should be the only thing that you do mm -hmm. just because, you know, you're trying to dive deep into something and your professors have these expectations. But because I was booking all these gigs and doing all this administrative work, it was taking away from my studies. And then uh, fast forward to like fall of the following year, I had just gotten married and my wife and I, we wanted to go out on a date to pick some apples because that's what you do in fall in Wisconsin. Uh-huh, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, up until that point, I had been using spreadsheets to keep track of my gigs and like email threads and text messages mm -hmm. and some even in like Facebook Messenger. Messy, yes. Very messy because ultimately nobody teaches you how to do all this. Like yep. in the in music school, nobody teaches that at all. And then in the business school, they're just like, oh, use a spreadsheet, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And for a while I was up until I wasn't, which was when I was an hour outside of my city uh, picking apples with Emily and I, I was picking Honeycrisp apples too I remember the the variety that's my favorite by the way mine too they taste amazing amazing so as I'm picking them I get a phone call from a wedding planner and it's a Saturday afternoon usually that's when weddings are but I had checked my spreadsheet so I was like I'm good but when I saw the wedding planners name on my my phone I started <laughs> my heart started pounding a little faster and I had this thought in the back of my mind, like, oh, crap, what did I do? I answered it, and my worst fears were true. Um, she was yelling on the other end. She said, Jared, the, string, uh, the bride walks down the aisle in 10 minutes. Where are the strings? And, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. I just kind of froze. And then I, I apologized to her. I said, let me figure this out. I will call you right back. I tried calling every string player in Milwaukee that I had their phone number. Nobody could get to this wedding in 10 minutes. Mm. I called the DJ and I said, hey, I screwed up bad. Can you please cover the ceremony and I will clean up this mess after the wedding. And luckily the DJ said, I got you. And so afterwards I called the wedding planner and I called the bride and the groom and their parents. And I just had to go Man. on this, I had to go on this apology tour and it was so embarrassing. I felt terrible because I ruined somebody's wedding. And I thought that at that point, my gigging career was over. Like I'd worked so hard working with the business school, figuring this out. And I just ruined it all in one slip of the mind or slip of the spreadsheet. Mm. So uh, I refunded their money for the string quartet, obviously. I also paid for their DJ because I felt so bad. And then I kind of went um, on a little bit of a drinking tour too. <laughs> yeah, I probably would have done that too. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so a couple of days after that, I was at a bar and I wanted to, to come home and I obviously I wasn't going to drink and drive. And so I called an Uber and I don't know how I thought of this in my 
less than sober state. But I said this app is kind of managing a gig for the driver. It's telling the driver where to go, like the date and the time. It's telling them the venue to pick me up at. And then it's going to pay the driver afterwards. And I bet there's no staff at Uber like pushing these buttons to make it happen. It just all kind of happens. I need something like that for my gig. If I had that, then I wouldn't have missed this one gig. So then I started to look, is there anything out there that does this? And nothing quite did it the way that I needed it to to help me run a busy private event group. And so I decided that I would pull out the old coding book that I had started to learn in middle school. Oh my. <laughs> and pulled several all-nighters and figured out how to create this very basic first version of what's now booklive.com. And I put in our next wedding and I said, it's November 12th at this venue and I need two violins, a viola and a cello to fill out the string quartet. I want Paul here. I want me on second violin. I want uh, Catherine on viola and Jackie on cello. And so I told the app that and I pressed one button and then it spat out emails to all four of them, including myself. And then it also sent them all text messages. And it gave them an option, like it told them, here's the date, the time, the venue, and how much it pays. Click this button if you're available. Click no if you're not. And I, I just kind of prayed that it worked. But the crazy part was within like 30 seconds, I got a vibration on my phone that said, hey, Paul just said yes. And then 30 seconds later, it said, Catherine's not available, but Dana is available. Would you like me to put her instead? And all of a sudden, I had this like light bulb moment. I just freed myself from the administrative hell that I was in before. Oh gosh. Wow. And so that app kind of started there, but it's expanded into something that not just staffs these gigs and makes sure that I'm not going to miss one, but also like helps me write and send these contracts so that all my gigs are secure and I'm not going to get stiffed like I once did. Um, and then it also saves my time working with all the brides and grooms because it lets them log in and pick their wedding playlist. Mm, out of, that's out awesome. Of, yeah, it, so it's super helpful for me. But then I also had some of the, my students ask me, hey, we want to use that for our gigs too. Will you let us? And I thought about it and I was like, that could be kind of cool. Yeah, here's a special login for you. And since then, we actually have about 2,000 musicians who are now using the BookLive software to get themselves out of the administrative hell that they might have created for themselves by booking all of these high paying gigs. Wow, that's incredible. How did I not know about this already? I feel like I should have. Has it been like more regional or do you have people using it like worldwide? Uh, right now, it's mostly U.S. We do have one Canada user, um, but we're trying to keep it U.S. just because we know the U.S. gigging landscape more so than international, plus mm -hmm. like the legalities of selling things internationally we're, we're not quite sure about yet, so we're not trying to sell outside of the U.S. That makes sense. So let's talk, I mean, I love all this and I, I seriously didn't know about this app, so this is really helpful. I know that a lot of our listeners are going to check it out. Uh, just while we're talking about it, how can they check it out? Because I think they'll be excited to try to use it. Yeah. Um, so if they go to booklive.com, there's a page that will give them a two-week free trial to, to give it a shot. And once they go into it, we actually have some training courses inside of it, like how to use automation for music, because it sounds kind of intimidating, automating things but we make it super easy and musician friendly because we're all musicians ourselves. Yeah, it does sound intimidating until you use it and you're like, holy crap, where have you been all my life? This automation is awesome, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so booklive.com and they can get a free trial. So let's talk about the kind of the gig landscape over the past two years, right? It's been crazy. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've still had gigs all throughout this COVID period, how did you manage that? And how is it looking now? Yeah, for sure. When COVID hit, like, you know, March of 2020, first there was a little bit of like, wait and see what's gonna happen, I don't know. And I remember when I first heard about it, I was actually uh, doing trivia at a bar and I heard the word coronavirus for the first time. I was like, oh, I don't need to worry about that. That's not gonna come to the US. And then it did come to the U.S. And 
for a while, nothing really happened except like all of the the leads that we usually get, like the people saying, "Hey, we need you for our wedding." Those started to dry up a little bit, and I was like, "Okay, I'm just gonna wait and see here." Then we had people we'd already booked saying, "Hey, unfortunately, we have to postpone our wedding. Will you help us postpone it?" And we still want your strings when it does happen. So we had to figure out the whole how do we postpone a lot of weddings, and then um, things shut down for a little bit, which meant our income source was kind of drying up as musicians. You know, you don't get paid unless you play, which meant we had to pivot and figure out other ways to earn a living. Um, so I actually did a lot of virtual gigs, and I've listened to to your podcast before, and I, I hear a lot of your guests have mentioned we've done virtual gigs. So mm-hmm. I was in in that boat too. But the crazy thing about private events, though, is that the private events come back faster than the public events, because you know if it's a private business, there are fewer restrictions on how many people can be in there and the the requirements that you have to, you know. I I don't get political about anything, so, you know, save that for (laughs) whatever. (laughs) But uh, the private events come back faster, and so we were playing weddings earlier than I think many of the public concerts were happening. That makes sense. And also, they're usually smaller. Like, they could just decide, well, I don't want to postpone my wedding anymore. I'm going to bring it down from 100 people to 50 people, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's kind of when the term micro wedding, it wasn't coined now, but it really came into popularity during COVID. Um, These are like literally 10 to 20 people weddings. Like in someone's backyard or something. Yeah, totally. We played lots of micro weddings Mm. and we actually partnered with a a cool venue here in Milwaukee, um, Bottle House 42. They have started selling micro wedding packages at their venue, which is all included for like 10 to 20 people, the venue rental, the catering, the beverages, plus they, as part of their package, this was a really cool like partnership and a strategy that I teach was they actually included a solo violin or cello from my company. Mm. And so just by default, they are selling my gig to the people who want to book their venue. And then do you, when you connect with them, do you say, oh, we also have a quartet available? I do upsell them if nice they're interested. Nice upsell. Good job. Thank you. That, I love that. That's so cool. Um, the whole micro wedding thing that has become a thing. And I think that's actually, I think it's really helpful to young people like to know that that's an option because weddings can be so freaking expensive and to feel like it's okay to have a micro wedding. Definitely. I think it gives them a bit more freedom about it because, you know, the wedding industry is interesting i love being a member of it but i would never pay fifty thousand dollars for a wedding you know when i got married it it was less than half of that Mm -hmm. but there are some people who go all out and they pay literally a hundred thousand dollars or more on a wedding as a musician that gives me a lot of hope because people are willing to spend a lot of money on an experience and if you can position your group as a way for them to get that experience, then you can charge a high price. And ultimately that's the whole idea behind making a living through private events. Yeah. I mean, I think if you can paint that picture of like what it would look like without music, you know, I I can just imagine it in my head, like an amazing venue, everything looks awesome, but there's, but there's just dead. It's like no sound Mm -hmm. in the background. It does not sound appealing. For sure. And, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about my sales process that I um, I mentioned earlier that the business school taught me how to do like a sales process. When I am talking to brides and grooms, I do give them a presentation about my group and specifically about their perfect wedding with my group. And one of the stories I tell is like, if you have a DJ playing your walk down the aisle, when you get to the the aisle and you're ready to start the wedding, the DJ is not a live musician. Like the DJ is a live person, of course, and you can call them a musician too. But at the end of the day, they're playing a track where they have two options of how to end that track. <laughs> Either they turn the volume down, which if they do that and 
the singers in the middle of a word, you're going to miss half the word. Or they could just press the stop button and it'll completely stop all the music and it'll Super feel... Super awkward. I hate when they do that. Right? And so I tell all of my weddings that because that paints a clear picture. And then I say, with live musicians, we're reading the room, we're seeing the action that's going on, and we can actually adjust our playing to match it so that when you arrive at the end of the aisle, that's when we find a natural spot in our music to fade out gracefully. Mm -hmm. And then, then I play them a video of us actually doing that at a wedding. And that's when the light bulb goes off in their minds and they're sold. That's very cool. I love that idea. So weddings are one kind of private event. What other private events do you do and do you teach? Yeah, so corporate events are a big one. Um, so during COVID, that's been a less of, less realistic thing to do right now because corporations have not been having their larger events, but they are coming back now. But if you can imagine a corporate event where, say, they're throwing a cocktail hour or a big... Um, like a conference where they want some music for their reception. Those are really nice because corporations have big wallets and they can yep. af afford that and they want to give their, their clients that experience. Um, nonprofit galas as well. Yep, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm curious with the, with the corporate ones, like how do you position it? Because I can imagine they're thinking, well, if we're having a cocktail hour in a hotel, they can just pipe music through the speakers. How do you how do you position that to like why they need live music? Yeah. Um, so for corporations, a big thing in corporate event planning is they want to give people an experience, an immersive mm -hmm. experience. And so while they could just pipe music in, it gives a much more in the moment experience to have a live musician that when your guests walk into that ballroom and they see there's a band on stage and there's an interaction between the band and the guests, that is a much more immersive experience that creates a lasting impression for those clients. Yeah, and painting that picture for them for sure. Because I'm some of them, especially if they're not musicians, right? They're not thinking that way. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of what you're talking about in the sales process is just telling them a story in the way that they're getting the value of what you have because as musicians we totally see it but a lot of times it's not immediately clear to them until you paint that picture yeah exactly it's kind of like um when and this is slightly unrelated but uh when vince lombardi the the green bay packers football coach uh the story i always heard about him is that when he brought all of his players in for tr um, like training before the football season, he would tell all of these professional NFL players, he would hold up the football and say, this is a football. And then he would talk about it <laughs> in the most basic terms. Like these are the laces, this is the, because while it may be obvious to us, it's not obvious to everybody. And it's especially not obvious to non-musicians. So if we could spell out the things that seem obvious to us that we no longer even think about, that's what gives our live music value before we actually have a chance to perform for them. Yeah, sometimes we just, we're not thinking like that because we're so far beyond that. And I experience this as a course creator too. Like things to me are just, com certain things to me are just completely like ingrained. And I realize I didn't, kind of spell these out to people that are new to certain things. Yeah, for sure. You can't assume that everybody knows what nope. you're thinking. Nope, nope. But it's hard to remind yourself of that sometimes when you're in it. Um, so let's talk about how can people break into this industry? And, and I know that you kind of talked about some of the mistakes that people make when they're breaking into the industry. I'm sure you probably made some of them. That's how we all learn the mistakes, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I would say the first mistake would be undercharging mm. because, you know, as musicians, kind of like what we were just talking about, it's hard to value our services in a monetary way if we don't spell them out in a, you know, in a process, like just listing out what goes into an actual performance that we give. So one of the tools that I use is an offer stack. 
which breaks my performance. It's literally just like a, a table in a spreadsheet. Uh, don't be intimidated by spreadsheets. It's a it's really cool. Each line in the spreadsheet is just something that I bring to each performance. Like I bring one hour of my time. And then in the next column of that, I put how much that hour is worth, mm -hmm. which I, I start that at like $250. Then the next item would be the instruments that I bring. So I list out, here's the dollar value of my violin. And that's in the tens of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. range. And then you keep going, list how many songs are in your library and what did it cost you to either buy the sheet music for that or how much time did you invest learning in that and put your dollar amount. And all of a sudden you've got this like massive number at the bottom that is a truthful number because it is honestly what you're bringing to every single gig. Not to mention all the years of education and uh, learning the violin and all that, right? For sure, yeah. Like how much did your music degrees cost? Or <laughs> how much did you spend on private lessons over the years? Yep. So to me, that is like one of the biggest tools to not just like be able to come up with a good price, but to internalize like I am worth it. Like mm -hmm. I am literally worth this amount. And I feel like if musicians did that for themselves, it would just be game changing because then we would stop playing $50 gigs at bars and instead start charging what we're actually worth. Yeah, I think sometimes the value stack is even more valuable for us than it is for the people that we're talking to because we have to really believe that we're worth that. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves, this is why I am charging this much. and you know, really look that over before you start getting into that booking conversation. And then you'll feel like, yeah, I am totally worth this. I'm approaching this as a very confident person that I should be charging this much. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. And if you do start charging what you're worth, then kind of everything changes because you're able to afford a more comfortable lifestyle. You're not just chasing all these gigs that aren't worth your time. You don't have to take on as many private students to fill the gaps in your, mm -hmm. your income. I was thinking about another mistake that a lot of musicians, or at least I will be honest, that I made when I first starting out was not realizing that I am just a member of this larger pri like event planning community. Like when I'm playing at a wedding, it's not about me at all. Mm. And you kind of have to learn to forego your ego and that's when you start to realize like there's so many parts to this puzzle there's event planners who are making sure all of these things are happening there's florists who are trying to make the event look as good as it can and you know when when you first start out you're just kind of thinking oh i'm i'm the musician i'm just going to play my music and get paid and leave but what happens when a florist is struggling because the piece that they're putting up behind the altar is like falling down. Mm. And so I've made it a point now to like, when I'm all ready and set up and warmed up, you know, I'll check if anybody needs help. Not that I'm like saying, hey, here's free labor, but like just being a responsible and willing member of this event planning team and making sure like if the florist drops something, go pick it up and help them out. Hey, I love that because it is a team. It's a team that's putting it together. You know, you're an independent contractor, but you're a member of the team for that one event. And that's where you're going to get a ton of referrals, right? You might get referrals from the bride, but you also might get referrals from the florist and the event planner. You know, the event planner does her next event and there's no, they, they decide they want a string quartet and they don't have one that they know about. She's going to call you, right? Yeah, absolutely. It is about partnerships. Like if you think about it, when a when a bride and a groom, you know, say they have a really good experience with you and, you know, they're thinking about can they refer you to anybody, they might only know one or two more engaged couples who are eligible to have you perform at their wedding. But that florist might mm -hmm. see hundreds of mm -hmm. them in a given year. That's right. So that's how you build the partnerships, just by being a member of that team. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, something that I thought of that I struggled when, with when I did events like this, because I was also doing public events, um, you're, you play a different role, right? So in mm -hmm. a public event, you're receiving all of that, like, 
praise and people are coming up and talking to you afterward. Oh, your music was so awesome. They're buying your CDs. They're buying your merch, all that stuff. You don't get any of that when you're working a, a private event, like maybe afterward, you know, the, the bride loves it, right. And tells you about it. Or maybe there's a few people during the event that say that they love what you did, but mostly you're kind of in the background. Like you said, they're part of, you're one of the cogs in the wheel that make the event work. Did you ever struggle from that like, hey, see me over here, I'm not background music, you know? <laughs> That's a really good question. I guess I wouldn't necessarily say that I missed being like showered with praise. <laughs> I don't know, I'm- Oh, I'm now you're making me look like a big <laughs> egomaniac. <though. laughs> I don't intend to do that. I'm um, a singer, so that, that explains a lot, right? Yeah, for sure. I guess for me, I've always, I'm an introvert. Mm. Um, I've learned to cope with that and kind of fake being an extrovert well enough to make it work. But I don't know. I, I kind of enjoy that role. Mm. Um, back when I was in like fourth grade orchestra, my orchestra told, director told me, you are a really good second violinist. And at the time I was really insulted. <laughs> <laughs> but then I realized like there is so much importance to being a supportive role in somebody like in service of a greater good. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like even though I don't get that direct feedback from everybody, like at a wedding, I do still see the transformation that my music causes. Mm -hmm. I see the impact it has on the bride as she walks down the aisle. I see the tears coming down from people in the audience. And then there are even kids that will come up and like dance to our violin music as mm. we're playing. And so, you know, it might not be like applause and people might not be my mer buying my merch left and right. I still get to have that, that satisfaction of like, I've changed these people's lives with my music. Yeah, I definitely experienced that too. But like, it's definitely a mindset shift when you've done a lot of public events. So, you know, you singers out there, like if you feel totally weird when you do a wedding or or something like that because you're used to getting a lot of i don't know a lot of um kudos and stuff like it's just a different role and and it's a transition in your mind and i think it's good to do both personally i agree and we do both as well um we do mostly private events but we do play at like festivals and some other public things like i'm really trying to get this strings and beer kind of brewery concert series going. Um, I've had this idea since grad school to, I want to pair different beer with different pieces of either classical or contemporary music for my string quartet. And as we're playing our music, like I want to encourage our guests to drink those beers. Like here's a German piece, drink this German lager with it. That's fun. I love that. And you know what? It's breaking a little with, I feel like would be the norm. Like you feel like wine goes with strings, right? I don't know why it's maybe it's just my opera training, but like we always had wine, right? We didn't have beer at the opera. Oh yeah. And maybe my view is, you know, shifted because Milwaukee is a I was gonna beer say, You're Milwaukee and obviously you probably like beer better. So you're thinking about it that way, but I think it's kind of fun. It's like outside the box a little. Yeah, exactly. I love that. I love that idea. So is there anything that we haven't covered yet that you want to make sure to tell people around private gigs? Oh, um, there's, there's a lot to it. <laughs> um, it's the first thing I would say is there, it's not as hard to get into them as you think. Like it, it is a relationships based business and um, it's, it's not that hard to actually find out who are the partners that I need to get on my side. Um, so I actually do teach exactly how to do this. And one of my favorite things, I'll just kind of like preview part of what I teach. I do what's called the, the venue tour funnel mm. where I, I teach musicians, like here's how to identify all the venues in your city or within 50 miles that have access to the type of private events that would um, give you a chance to play your music and earn a living doing it. And then here is the exact email templates that you need to send to schedule a tour with the person at that venue. What do you do at the tour, which 
involves bringing your instrument, which is a lot of fun, mm. and then following up with them. So it's like a pretty simple strategy, but I don't see a lot of musicians doing it. Um, but it has crazy results because like just last week, you know, it's November here. It's getting into the holiday season. I went on a venue tour myself of this really super awesome um, private events venue in Milwaukee. They've got like a gallery wall with all original Milwaukee art from the 1920s to present wow. day. And I brought my violin and I played some holiday tunes and the venue owner, she was like very impressed because one, not many musicians just bring their instrument to a venue. And two, because she was like, this would be such a great fit for the, the people who have their events here. And she said, can I record you playing and post it to my LinkedIn? <laughs> like, yeah, you sure can. <laughs> yeah, why not? Sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I played like a, a little rendition of like, oh, Christmas tree. And then she posted it on LinkedIn and it, it gets likes and comments and shares. And that's basically free marketing for me mm -hmm. just because I decided to reach out and say, hey, I want to play, play my instrument in your venue. And you're also making them look good, yeah. right? People are seeing that on LinkedIn and like, like, oh, I love that. That's so cool. And it goes so well with the art and all that stuff. So I love that. I love that idea. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think when people are trying, and that's a great strategy, right? To get in, start getting in with some of the venues. I think people don't get into this market because it is so referral based. Like once you get in, you've got like this circle of people that constantly refer you, especially if like you were talking earlier about how if you really make relationships with vent planners and florists and people like that, that are in the industry that are meeting people all the time. Um, but like, I think the first thing that people tend to go to is like, is there some online, uh, you know, marketplace where I can put myself up for this kind of thing? Do you even recommend that? Or do you feel like that's, you know, just going to maybe find you a few people here and there, but not the best way to spend your time. So I do recommend those online marketplaces, but it is risky, mm. you know, because most of those online marketplaces you have to pay to be listed in. But I don't know, the, the kind of the ideal strategy, if you have as much time and money as possible, would be to list yourself everywhere and do everything. Mm. So, I don't know, I, I would start out with a few of the online marketplaces, and if you can't afford them, there are some that let you do like a lower tier, like they'll list you lower just if you don't pay anything. And you'll get a few inquiries here and there, and then once you start to actually book some of those paying shows, you can invest a little more mm. in the higher higher paid categories too. Do you find that the online marketplaces tend to attract people that are just like going for like the lowest price. Yeah, That's absolutely. That's what I've found too. I've heard that from a lot of my students. Mm hmm for sure. I think that's just the nature of marketplaces. When mm -hmm. somebody goes to a marketplace, they see a lot of musicians in the same category in their mind and they all kind of look the same. Yep. Like, you know, there's 50 different acoustic guitar players in my city and they all kind of play the same songs. <laughs> and how do you differentiate between them? So for somebody who's coming and looking to hire, really the only differentiating thing is price, which means it's a race to the bottom, Yeah. which that's that's no, no bueno, as I say. <laughs> so that's why you have to learn how to stop being a commodity and differentiate yourself, which... You know, I list myself on those directories, but my big strategy is like, I don't want the conversation to happen on that directory because mm -hmm. they give you messaging platforms inside them. And if you stay within that, like all of a sudden you're competing against all the other messages from everybody else who's priced cheaper than you. Yep. So that's why I try to bring them into my sales process and use that to differentiate myself, demonstrate the value of what I do and... Uh, it works like I'm no longer just attracting bottom feeders. It's kind of funny because like you can tell who is going to who's like a price shopper when they send you your first message. <laughs> and and so when I send them my message, which gets them to book a meeting with me, if they resist booking a meeting with me, 
that's how I know. Well, they just wanted the cheapest one anyway. Not right. worth my time. Yeah, that's good to know. So it sounds like they're really good for like leads, lead generators, but you don't want to only rely on that as your process for booking. And I think that's a great strategy, mm -hmm. right? Love it. This has been so awesome. I, I really have enjoyed this because I don't think I've had anyone on here talking about specifically these kinds of private events, you know? I, I talk a lot about things like house concerts, which are kind of like a hybrid, right? They're like a private public event, <laughs> which is a little interesting um, and I love them. Um, but this is a whole nother market that I think if people have tried to get into, I know myself as a singer, like I dabbled in this and I liked it when I got these kind of gigs, but I never went all in like you're talking about. And I think, especially being in Southern California, I could have probably filled my filled my calendar for months if I had really focused on this strategy. So I appreciate you sharing a lot of things that you teach on the show today. And I'm excited about your app. I would love for people to go check that out. Booklive.com, right? Yep, that's right. And awesome. I also just just released a book. It's called Gigging Secrets, and it has all of these strategies inside it too. Oh, look, he's got the book in hand. Very smart. <laughs> you watching on video, you can see the book. Yeah, for sure. So, so if anyone Amazon, wants to, I'm assuming it's on Amazon. Um, it's actually right now only available at GiggingSecrets.com. Oh, okay. But we might make it available on Amazon. Okay, so GiggingSecrets.com. Uh, booklive.com and then how can they connect with you on social media so my instagram is at jared judge um, i'm also on facebook and then book live is at book live app on instagram and facebook got it all right you guys go connect with him go take advantage of all these awesome resources and jared i really appreciate you sharing all this wisdom with us today Bree, thank you so much it's been a pleasure Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 